Investing in cheap stocks has historically delivered market-beating returns and is one of the favoured strategies among many individual stock pickers, with one of the most famous and successful investors of all time, Warren Buffett himself being a value investor, who has been able to achieve an annualised return of 19.8% from 1965 to the present, compared with the 9.9% annualised return of the S&P 500 index. The problem is, I, like many others, have to be honest with ourselves that we're probably not as good at picking stocks as Warren Buffett. And managing a portfolio of individual value stocks takes a lot of time, research, reading company reports, and at times, periods of underperformance, which can lead to a lot of stress and self-doubt. Well, luckily for us, through the power of ETFs, value investing is easier for retail investors than ever before. By investing in the right value factor ETF, we can potentially access the market-beating returns that value stocks could potentially offer, with pretty much no effort. This video is the latest instalment in my factor investing series. Factors are research-based investing styles that, in theory, can give investors access to superior risk-adjusted returns over the long term. Value is one of five main investing factors, alongside quality, momentum, size, and minimum volatility. These are little discussed on YouTube, and especially UK Finance YouTube, with all the focus on market cap weighted index funds. This is certainly not a bad way to invest, but through this series, I hope to make more people aware of factor investing and show how easy it is to become a factor investor through ETFs. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the other episodes in this series. I'll put a link to the playlist on the screen. In this video, I'll start off by going through what the value factor is and why investing in a value factor ETF could deliver market beating returns. I'll then look at the main index by MSCI that value factor ETFs track and break it down before comparing the ETFs available to help you decide which, if any, are for you. And finally, I'll go over a few things you should consider before deciding to invest in the value factor. Of note, I will focus on global value factor ETFs in this video, as these offer geographical diversification alongside the factor exposure. If you're interested in a country-specific value factor ETF, there are some out there. As always, these videos are not financial advice, or a recommendation to invest in any of the featured ETFs. I make these videos for informational and entertainment purposes. Past performance does not guarantee future results, and when investing, your capital is at risk. You may get back less than what you put in. So, what is the value factor? When researching any investing factor, my first point of call is MSCI's Factor Focus Papers. As one of the largest index providers in the world, they offer a comprehensive set of literature and data that perfectly summarise different factors. As MSCI state, the foundation of value investing is the notion that cheaply priced stocks will outperform pricier stocks in the long term. The concept was first popularised in the 1930s by Benjamin Graham and David Dodd, who advocated owning companies that provide a margin of safety, which essentially means purchasing them when the stock price is less than it should be based on projections of future earnings. Value can be measured in a number of different ways. But with research in mind, MSCI's enhanced value indexes, which I'll break down in more detail later in this video, use three main valuation metrics. Forward price to earnings, also known as the forward PE ratio, enterprise value to operation cash flows, and price to book value, also known as PB ratio. Using these metrics over others allows the enhanced value index to avoid what is known as a value trap. These are stocks that can appear cheap, but in fact do not necessarily represent good value at all. Using forward PE ratio, rather than trailing, looks to the future and avoids companies that have a cheap valuation at the moment based on previous earnings, but have earnings that are expected to decline going forward. Also, looking at enterprise value to operation cash flows allows the index to avoid companies that are highly leveraged, meaning they carry a high level of debt. I like to pick on Vodafone in my videos, and in this case, it gives me the perfect example of a potential value trap from a PE ratio perspective. I'll caveat this by saying that I do not know the future, and maybe Vodafone will turn around its performance and give investors good returns. You can never know. However, the reason it's a perfect example of a potential value trap is because its current trailing PE ratio is only 2.09, which is probably one of the lowest PE ratios in the FTSE 100. If you purely looked at this, Vodafone represents a very cheap stock. However, if we look to the future and look at the forward PE ratio, this comes in at 13.74. This changes Vodafone from looking like one of the best value opportunities to being a mediocre value stock at best. And by looking at the recent performance of the Vodafone share price, it seems investors would also agree that they're worried about it being a potential value trap. So that is what the value factor in a value trap is, but what kind of outperformance can we expect from investing in an ETF that tracks an index such as the MSCI World Enhanced Value? Well, as stated, MSCI have an abundance of data on this topic, 
And using this chart they have published, we can see that the World Enhanced Value Index has delivered market beating returns since December 1999, with a 2% annualised excess return over MSCI World, which is MSCI's standard market cap weighted developed world index. This data clearly supports the existence of the value premium and the importance of looking beyond simple market cap weighted index funds when seeking the highest potential returns. Before going any further, if you're enjoying the video so far, please do leave a like. It's greatly appreciated and it keeps me motivated to make more of these videos. Thank you. With the outperformance and premium that the value factor can offer made clear, I'll now take a closer look at the MSCI World Enhanced Value Index via the fact sheet. In the description, we can see, as mentioned, the index is constructed using three variables, price to book value, price to forward earnings, and enterprise value to cash flow from operations. It is based on MSCI's standard developed markets tracker, MSCI World, so it includes large and mid-cap stocks from 23 developed market countries. Therefore meaning that any ETF that tracks this will also provide geographical diversification in your portfolio. Another important point to note is that it picks value stocks within the constraints of the sector breakdown of MSCI World. So it is technically a sector neutral index. Although I'm not a fan of sector neutrality for the quality index, it does not bother me that much for a value factor index. Because without this sector neutrality, a value index would be dominated by the financial sector as they tend to have cheap stocks and therefore it would have very little exposure to tech stocks that could represent good value for example. Scrolling down to look at the performance chart, you'll see that value has not had a good time recently, with this value index actually underperforming the standard index over the past 10 years. This serves as a reminder that, although factors are research based and shown to have explained outperformance in the long term, in certain periods they may underperform as is the case here. This is highlighted further in the annualised return, which shows the 10-year annualised return for MSCI World Enhanced Value is only 4.48% compared to 7.53% for MSCI World. So that is some significant underperformance recently. However, looking back further, you can see since 1997, the value factor has outperformed the market cap weighted index. And bringing back up this chart that I showed earlier, it has delivered a 2 percentage point annualised premium since 1999. So although the recent performance may not be encouraging, it is worth putting the factor in the context of wider history. In certain periods, factors may underperform, but that does not mean that the factor premium has disappeared. Look at this comparison by MSCI, which shows how factors have performed in different years. You'll see that value was right at the bottom in 2018 to 2020, but if we go back to the early 2000s, the MSCI World Enhanced Value Index not only beat the market, but also every other factor in 2001, 2003, 2004 and 2006. This is the reason why, in my factor portfolio, I've not gone all in on any one factor. Whether value will outperform going forwards, we cannot be sure, but I do think this table does show why we should not rush to say a value ETF is rubbish because of recent disappointing performance. Returning to the fact sheet, looking at the fundamentals, you'll see the effects of the value filters. Unsurprisingly, of course, the value index has a much lower PE ratio, forward PE ratio and price to book value. Regarding risk, value investing is more risky and volatile than the standard index, which is shown by the 10 year annualized standard deviation of 15.74% compared to 14.68% for MSCI World. Value investing has also been more risky throughout further history as well, but that higher risk has been compensated through better returns. As this chart shows, from December 1999 to December 2022, MSCI World Enhanced Value had the greatest level of annualised risk, but it also delivered the best returns. In terms of number of holdings, the value index is more concentrated, with only 397 holdings compared to 1,511 for MSCI World, and that is just a reflection of filtering out companies based on a factor. Of course, there'll be less companies included. Looking across at the top 10, you'll see that this is completely different to the standard MSCI world. And thanks to the sector neutrality of MSCI world enhanced value, there are actually a lot of tech stocks here, although they are currently the less talked about ones, which is of course the point of value. Intel comes in at the top spot with a 3.41% weight, but you can see in the parent MSCI world index, Intel only has a weighting of 0.29%. Another thing of note here is that there is actually two UK stocks that find their way into the top 10, Shell and British American Tobacco. This is a reflection of the fact that although the UK is very short of growth stocks, it does score highly on value criteria. This is also highlighted in the sector breakdown, which shows that the USA is massively underweighted due to it being dominated by growth stocks rather than value stocks at the moment. And as we can see, Japan, the UK and other European countries have a much greater weighting than they do in the standard MSCI world. Clearly there are value stocks to be found around the world at the moment, and regarding Japan, 
I do remember reading an article that Warren Buffett had invested heavily in Japan recently due to there being good value opportunities. I'll put the article on screen if I can find a source. So, we now have a very good idea of how the MSCI World Enhanced Value Index breaks down, but in order to actually invest in it, we need to look at an ETF that tracks it. And there is not much choice, with only two options, iShares MSCI World Value, ticker IWFV for the accumulating version, and IWVG for the distributing version. I'll focus on the accumulating version in this video. And the other option is XTrackers MSCI World Value, ticker XDEV. First of all, I want to point out that the names are misleading, as MSCI World Value is a completely different index to the World Enhanced Value. And if we look at the fact sheets for these ETFs, we can see that it is actually the enhanced index they track. I do think these ETF providers should not be able to give their ETFs misleading names like this, because if you search MSCI World Value on Google, you'll come across the wrong fact sheet. But it is what it is, and just make a note of that when doing your own research. In terms of fees, the X-Trackers version comes out on top, with a total expense ratio of 0.25% compared to the iShares total expense ratio of 0.3%. Not much between them, but a difference nonetheless. Those who watch my other videos know that I like to look a lot further than just expense ratio before deciding which to invest in. I'll also look at fund size, bid offer spread and fund age before comparing the performance iShares have the larger fund with over $4 billion of assets under management compared to the X-Trackers ETF with an AUM of $1.14 billion. So neither of them are at a size where they are at danger of being shut down by the provider and they are both large enough that they should have good bid offer spreads. Bid offer spread matters because it is basically the transaction cost when buying an ETF. When you buy, you pay slightly more than what you can sell it for and the market maker pockets the difference. So the lower the bid offer spread, the better. In the case of these ETFs, according to the London Stock Exchange on Friday the 10th of November, the bid offer spread of the X-Trackers ETF is 0.097% and the iShares one has a spread of 0.066%. A slight win for the iShares ETF here, which is unsurprising given the larger fund size and thus greater liquidity. But to be honest, this is a tiny difference and not something I'd worry about too much. Next, looking at fund age, the X-Trackers ETF was launched on the 11th of September 2014, and the iShares ETF was launched on the 3rd of October 2014. Again, pretty much no difference at all. The only reason fund age matters is because if it was really new, then you do not have much past performance data to go off, and you can't be sure if the ETF will do a good job of tracking the index. I think from putting all these points together, there is no clear winner. But I do slightly favour the X-Trackers version due to the lower total expense ratio, which should more than make up for the ever so slightly worse bid offer spread. And this is shown when comparing the past performance of the two ETFs. Over the maximum time period, XDEV has provided a return of 103.75% compared to 95.9% .9 for IWFV. Over the past five years though, the performance is much closer, with only a 0.24 percentage point difference between them. So I would have to conclude that you can't really go too wrong regardless of which one you pick. Before I go over some final things to consider, both of the ETFs featured are available on many investment platforms. But in terms of platforms I use, they are all available on Trading212, Invest Engine, and Hargreaves Lansdowne. You won't be able to find them on Vanguard, as Vanguard only offers its own funds and does not have any factor funds at the moment. And if you're looking to start your own factor investing portfolio, why not consider opening an account with Invest Engine, which is currently my favorite platform. I use it for my main portfolio, as it has zero fees for its DIY stocks and shares ISA, meaning the only fees you pay are the fees of the ETFs themselves. They've also recently introduced collections, making it easy to browse through their 580 plus ETFs on offer. And if you go to the Factor collection, you'll be able to find value factor ETFs among ETFs that give you exposure to all other investing factors. Be sure to check out the link in the description, as if you sign up through it, you'll get a bonus of between £10 and £50 when you invest £100 yourself. A big thank you to anyone who does use that link, I really do appreciate it. And as always remember, T's and C's apply, and when investing, your capital is at risk. There are a few things that I think you should consider before deciding to invest in a value factor ETF. Firstly, as shown, value has delivered great returns, but also has greater risk and volatility, this means it might not be for everyone if they're easily scared by periods of poor performance or volatility in their portfolio, as has been the case over the past decade. Factors come in and out of favour, and although past performance does not guarantee future results, and the value factor has had a tough time recently, in previous years it has been the best performing factor. Another danger of value investing is value traps. Although MSCI World Enhanced Value does seek to minimise exposure to value traps through the selection criteria it uses, there is no guarantee that some will not sneak into the index. These stocks may appear good value, but proceed to decline further. This is only a very brief run through of things to consider, 
and be sure to do your own due diligence when investing. If you like this video, you might want to check out my other factor investing videos. I'll put a couple of the links on screen now. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and as always, thank you for watching.